Good morning and welcome to our worship here at our Redeemer Lutheran Church in Jacksonville, Florida. This is the day that the Lord hath made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We are so happy to have all of you joining us for our service, those in the sanctuary and also those who join us by live stream for our service as well. It is a beautiful day in Jacksonville and what a wonderful opportunity to be together on this fourth Sunday in Lent to worship the Lord. Uh, as we do so, we'll be turning to the Order of Matins, which is a service of morning praise, the service being found in your bulletin this morning. As we worship this morning, we continue the sermon series for the Sundays in Lent called The Consequential Love of Christ. Each week we're looking at one of the appointed readings or another text which uses the word therefore to connect us to important truths about our Savior and what he has done for us. 
In the case of our readings today, the word therefore is not found, but it is the very next word, the word following the epistle reading. So uh, the text will be from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 and following, as we consider the consequential love of Christ today, that he draws us near to him. And so the first hymn is a hymn by Fanny Crosby, the most prolific hymn writer probably in human history, a blind woman who wrote more than 8,000 hymns. Let's rise as we sing the hymn near the cross. Lord have 
So give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom He has redeemed from trouble, and gathered in from the land, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Some wandered in desert wastes, finding no way to a city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their souls fainted within them. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way, till they reached the city to dwell in. Let them, give, let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous work to the children of men. For he satisfies the longing soul, and the hungry soul he feeds. You may be seated as we join in the hymn for the word. Both, uh, speak, O Lord, your servant listens. of your bulletin as we have the scripture readings this morning. We thank uh, Bill Brown for being our lector. Please note that following the Old Testament lesson, there will be another hymn. Good morning. The Old Testament reading for this Sunday is found in Numbers chapter 21 beginning at the fourth verse. From Mount Or they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water and we loathe this worthless food. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, 
and they bit the people so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please note that in most of the hymns this morning, you will find the word near. The theme of the message is brought near by the blood of Jesus. We join now in singing the hymn, Precious Lord, Take My Hand. Let us rise to the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Gospel for this fourth Sunday in Lent is John chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. Jesus said, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light, because their deeds were evil. 
For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his deeds have been carried out in God. We have an advocate with the Father. Jesus is the propitiation for our sins. He was delivered up to death. He was delivered for the sins of the people. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven and whose sin is put away. He was delivered up to death. an advocate with the Father. Jesus is the propitiation for our sins. He was delivered up to death. He was delivered for the sins of the people. I think most of us probably learned John 3.16 from our parents early in life or perhaps from a Sunday school teacher. The hymn which we sing now is the sermon hymn is based on that gospel in a nutshell, John 3.16. You may be seated as we sing. through our Lord and living Savior, Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen. As we continue the series of the consequential love of Christ, we come to another verse which uses the word, therefore. It is the verse following our text, and the text reads, 
For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that is not your own doing. It too is the gift of God, not because of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Therefore, and that text will be read during the message. Let us join in prayer as we consider together the theme brought near by the blood. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you that even though we were by nature sinful and unclean enemies of God, separated from him eternally, you willingly came into this world at your Father's sending to suffer and die on the cross, that our sins might be forgiven and that we might be brought near by that blood which you shed. Lord, you know there are many people who are still far from you. We have received this wonderful news that we are saved by, uh, from sin and brought near by the blood of Christ and through his grace alone. The well, Lord, help us that we might go forth to tell others that they too might trust in Christ and be brought near to God. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Dear friends in Christ, have you seen any before and after pictures lately? You know what I'm talking about. A before and an after picture is you see something or someone, what they look like, what it looks like before renovation or before a makeover, a redo, and then you see the after picture which shows the amazing results. I think that uh, before and after pictures probably were first made popular in magazines such as Better Homes and Gardens, which would show what a house looked like before all the expense and effort was put into renovating it, uh, or a garden or something else connected to the home. Well, these days, programs show the dramatic transformation that can take place uh, after similar hard work. We see it on television or even uh, in YouTube videos and the like, what the results can be after the renovation takes place. Uh, we also see on YouTube and on television what it looks like when people have had a facelift before and after, or even gotten a new hairdo. When I was growing up in Ellsworth, Iowa, my mother every Friday went to the beauty shop to get her hair washed it was the only time all week she washed it. I still don't understand how she could stand that. She got it washed and set and cut or styled when needed. Well, one day, uh, Friday, I was at home and I had forgotten what day it was, I guess. I asked my, my dad where mom was and he said, oh, she's down at uh, the beauty shop getting recycled. So ever since then, Mom was recycled on Fridays, and the results were always very nice. I think we can all enjoy seeing the results of a makeover, whether to us personally, to our home, or to someone else. In today's epistle, St. Paul describes the before and after picture of life for those who have come to know Jesus Christ. He wants us to see the stark difference, the amazing change that takes place in the life of one who is baptized and trusts in Jesus as their Savior. A spiritual makeover accomplished by God's Spirit through the Word of the Gospel is something that every sinner needs to see and to receive. The words of St. Paul today then will encourage us to remember that B.C., before Christ, first of all, you were separated from Christ and his church. This is the first of three before pictures that the apostle shares with us. Now, you know the letters B.C. and A.D. stand for before Christ and the Latin expression anno domini, which, is, uh, which means in the year of our Lord. This dating system of B.C. and A.D. was first devised in 525 A.D. by Dionysius Exigus of Scythia Minor, but was not widely used for another 300 years. So for between 
1200 and 1500 years, history and time itself has been divided into BC before Christ and those years since Jesus' birth in the year of our Lord. Now, because BC is the, the English for before Christ, some people have mistakenly concluded that AD stands for after his death. Well, that's not the case, of course, but rather, from the time Jesus was born, life changed in this world, BC and AD. Well, as you know, in more recent years, some historians use a nomenclature which is less religious, more politically correct, uh, CE meaning the common era and BCE before the common era. This change, I suppose, suppose was made to mask the Christian basis for the historical dating system and it's one that I don't appreciate and I'm sure you don't either. Well, according to St. Paul, in our life BC, then we were first of all separated from Christ and his church. And what a sad picture this is. St. Paul, of all people, would certainly stand that Jesus Christ stands at the center of history. He's also the center of our lives. And so today I would have you remember your life B.C. before Christ, if you're able to do so. Now I'm sure that many of you cannot remember a time when you did not know the Lord. You were baptized as an infant or a young child. You've always gone to a church, with, uh, first with your parents, and now, of course, on your own as an adult. Uh, you were baptized into the Christian faith, and you embraced this faith wholeheartedly, and you may not remember a time without Him. Others of you today, however, may distinctly remember a time B.C., a time when you did not know that the Lord Jesus is the one who died to forgive your sins. A time when you did not know that he has already written your name on a place in heaven and he has written it in his blood. I believe that we all need to remember what life was without Christ and what it is now. And St. Paul's words help us to do so. We need to remember that at one time, you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what, by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hand. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. And in these words, St. Paul, of course, is speaking to Gentile Christians of his generation but he is also, as God's spokesman, spokesman, speaking to the rest of us, too. He tells of the condition of the Gentiles, all non-Jews, before Christ came. He's speaking of the great division that existed between Jewish people and the Gentiles. William Barclay comments that the Jew had a great contempt for the Gentiles. They said that the Gentiles were created to be fuel for the fires of hell, that God loved only Israel of all the nations, and that the Gentiles, the non-Jews, had no possibility to be saved. In fact, it was not even lawful to, to an ancient Israelite to help a Gentile woman in childbirth because he would be bringing another Gentile into the world. The barrier between Jew and Gentile was absolute. If a Jew married a Gentile, the funeral of that Jewish person was carried out. He, was, he or she was dead to their family. Even to go to a, into a gentle, Gentile house made a Jew unclean. I remember my wife telling about when her sister was dating a young Jewish man in Miami. And on those few occasions when she was allowed into their home, as she was leaving, she could hear them breaking the dishes that she had used. That's how seriously Jews looked upon Gentiles with contempt. And still today, an Orthodox Jew will avoid contact with a Gentile, and they will have a funeral for a Jewish relative who marries a Gentile or a Christian. So, separated from Christ and his church. 
an ugly before picture, I think you'll agree, separated from the Commonwealth of Israel. But the second picture is this, the second before picture, speaks of us as being strangers to the covenant of promise. I think you'll agree that it's very sad and unfortunate to see the division which exists in our society today because of skin color, language, customs, or beliefs. In our world today, I think that we see division at, an, at a degree to which we perhaps have not encountered it, at least in recent memory. Well, it was even worse in Jesus' day. It's ironic that the Jews so completely rejected the Gentiles because even in the Old Testament scriptures, the concept of hospitality to a stranger was deeply ingrained. It's seen in the story, for example, of Abraham entertaining three strangers that came into his camp, providing a meal and showing them kindness, and other stories as well would show this. Uh, in the Old Testament times, even in New Testament times, hospitality was not only a common courtesy, but it could be a matter of life and death because people did not have restaurants, convenience stores, grocery stores to go to. Many times if a, another person did not show human kindness and meet a need, that need would go unmet and it even could result in the loss of a life. And so in Romans 12, 13, the apostle says, contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Hebrews 13, 2, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. And such was the case with Abraham, because it's commonly believed that one of those strangers was uh, the Lord in his pre-incarnate condition, the term the angel of the Lord, is often used in the Old Testament to refer to, to the Christ uh, appearing in Old Testament situations prior to the Incarnation. And so it is that we are to remember that we were separated from Christ, alienated from the Commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the promise, the covenants of promise. The Gentiles then did not know anything about God's covenant with Noah or the covenant made with Abraham. The covenant passed on through King David and all of his descendants. The covenant fulfilled in the coming of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Jews of Jesus, they had no concern for the law. They felt no obligation whatsoever to tell people about the true God. We thank God for seeing to it that both the Old and the New Testament does in fact teach us about a God who has shown his love for the entire world. He does not want anyone to be a stranger to the covenant of promise. He does not want anyone to be separated from Christ and his church. Rather, he desires all to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. A third before picture is this. Before Christ, we are spiritually hopeless and godless. St. Paul says, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in this world. I believe that that latter phrase, without God and having no hope in this world, is probably one of the most depressing, the saddest descriptions for people in the Bible. It was true that the Gentile was without hope because he was without God, Barclay says. Israel had always had the radiant hope in God which was clearly seen in the Old Testament. Even in the darkest days, the Jews could hear the words of the true God who continually cared for them. But the Gentile knew only despair before Christ came to give him hope. That's not just a theological description of people 2,000 years ago, but these before pictures describe to us many people that we know. Are you content for those people to remain B.C. 
to be separated from Christ and his church eternally, to be strangers to the covenant promise, to be spiritually hopeless and godless? No! Unlike the Jews of the Old Testament, Jesus taught a picture of a God who loves all people so much that he sent his own son into the world so that they might have life and salvation through him. You see, this before picture was the picture of each of us before Jesus Christ came into his life through the means of grace, the word, and the sacraments. Remember that what you were before Christ, but most importantly, remember what you are now in Christ. Brought near by the blood of Christ is the first of three after pictures that St. Paul gives to us. What we once were, we are no longer by God's grace. Remember the word, therefore. Therefore we are saved by grace through faith in Christ, not because of our works. And so, in the verses immediately following our text, that's when St. Paul speaks that word, therefore, to describe the before and the after picture that all of us might trust in Christ and share him with others. And as uh, Paul continues to say, now, in Christ, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Therefore, remember what you were, but remember what you are. Once separated, now you are brought near by the blood of Christ. And that's not just someone's opinion. Rather, it's the inspired word of God that promises, us, promises to us that this is our new situation. It's our new condition. These words assure us that we've received a divine makeover. Now in Christ you are brought near by the blood, the blood that Jesus shed on the cross for you when he died on Calvary. He suffered and died not because he was a criminal, as was alleged by the Jews and the Romans, not because he was sinner, a sinner, but rather because he came to bear your sins and mine. As the sinless Son of God, he went to the cross as our substitute to make the blood sacrifice that would wipe our slate clean and would bring us back to a holy God. An old hymn asks, What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me pure within? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, how precious is that flow which makes me white as snow. No other hope I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. St. Paul continues his description of the spiritual renovation that has been accomplished in our lives by Christ and his gracious work. He is the one who brings us near, those who were once separated, aliens and strangers to the covenant of promise, brings us near to him, makes us members of his family, and assures us that the way is prepared, that we can spend eternity also at the very throne of God. Our Heavenly Father is like the father in the story of the prodigal son, not only searching the horizon and looking longingly for his son to return, Remember the father in that story, his heart went out to his son and he runs to him even before the boy has been able to give his well-rehearsed speech at confessing his sin and asking to be taken on as a hired servant. So also God our Father, his heart went out to us as he gave us his son that we might be saved. That's what Jesus told elderly Nicodemus in the conversation recorded in John chapter 3. It's the message that changed the man's life. Say it with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Now this man, Nicodemus, was chided by Jesus a little bit because he did not know what the Lord was talking about with spiritual rebirth and all of these other important things. Uh, and Jesus said, you are a teacher of Israel and you did not know these things. But fortunately, he swallowed his pride 
Yes, it's true. He came to Jesus by night. He didn't want anybody to see that he was going to talk to the Lord. But at least he came. So also in the quiet of our hearts, we confess our sins to the Lord. We ask him to, to uh, show us his grace and kindness, to forgive our sins and to restore us. We confess our sins and look to Jesus every day. Martin Luther said that a, uh, a Christian lives a life of repentance and faith. And so Nicodemus was forever changed because of his encounter with Jesus and the message which Jesus shared with him. Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We are brought near by the blood of Jesus, our sacrificed Lamb. The story is told of John Wesley, one of the two brothers, Charles and John, who began the Methodist Church. John Wesley was uh, riding his horse late one night through the countryside singing a favorite hymn. He was startled by a fierce voice shouting, Halt! and a firm hand that seized the horse's bridle. Then the man said, Your money or your life? Wesley emptied his pockets obediently of the few coins that he had, and he invited the robber to examine his saddlebags, which were simply filled with books. Disappointed at the result, the robber was turning away when the evangelist cried out, Stop! I have something more to give you. Then Wesley said, My friend, you may live to regret this sort of life in which you are engaged. If you ever do, I want you to remember this. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. The robber hurried quietly away, and Wesley went on his way too, praying for the man who had accosted him. Years later, at the close of a Sunday evening service with uh, the people streaming from the large church building, many people lingered around the doors hoping to shake hands with, uh, with John Wesley. A stranger stepped forward and begged to speak with him. Wesley was surprised to find before him the man who many years earlier had robbed him on the way. He told Wesley how his life had changed after that night and he was there to thank Wesley. He said, to you, dear sir, I owe it all. Wesley rep replied softly, Nay, nay, my friend, not to me, but to the precious blood of Christ, which cleanses us from all sin. What a great after picture. And that's the after picture that the Lord gives for you and me. That's how we may see ourselves too, as people brought near by the blood of Christ, and secondly, at peace both with God and with people near or far. That's the second after picture. Remember that A.D., now in Christ, you are both at peace with God and may be at peace with others. For he himself is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of, com of the commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. The God who brought us near to himself, reconciling the world to his Son, is also the God who has brought us back to himself that we might be at peace with God and he is the God who would have us also be at peace with others. The story of Wesley could be repeated over and over again with only the names and the details being different. The division which we see between people in the world today is simply proof that they need the Lord so we may come together at the cross Finally, remember that A.D., now in Christ, you are also blessed to be fellow citizens with the saints. Three before pictures, three after pictures, brought near by the blood, at, both at peace with God and with others, and blessed to be fellow citizens with the saints. And so Paul concludes, See then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints 
and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. What we were is the great consequence of the fall into sin at Satan's temptation. What we are is the greater consequence, the therefore, of God's saving grace in Jesus alone. We show our faith and joy. We let others know that we're glad to be citizens of the kingdom of God, particularly these days when we see such strife in the earthly kingdom. Remind people that through faith in Jesus, you belong to God's kingdom where there is peace and joy and love. We celebrate being a saint, a forgiven sinner, every time we come together for worship or sing a hymn or speak a word of love and forgiveness to another person. The transformation of each of us, from sinner to saint, is entirely the result of God's dying love on the cross of Calvary. His resurrection, the resurrection of Christ, has resulted in the new life we enjoy and the image of God being renewed in us that others may see. We've been brought near by the blood of Christ. Now turn and look at somebody else. Turn to the person next to you and say, what a great after picture I see of God's love in Jesus. Amen. And may the peace of God which surpasses our human understanding keep our hearts and minds in Christ our Lord and Savior. We join now in singing the Te Deum, but please note it is not the uh, one we normally do. This is a, a hymn version of the Te Deum which you find printed in the bulletin. Let's rise as we sing.
As we gather for worship today, we also want to remember those who request special prayers. Do we have additions to the prayer list? Seeing none, I call your attention to the prayers in the bulletin this morning. Uh, we have a lengthy list of uh, people who need the Lord's blessing and help. We thank the Lord for his blessing. For Robin Paris, who's been recovering from her surgery. Continued prayers for other members as listed. And we would pray for the family of George... Okay, thank you. For the family of George Besson. George Besson is the father of our member, Monica Besson. Uh, George passed away this week. We would pray for God's continued care and blessing for the entire family. Continued, continued prayers also requested for Joan Goosen, Karen Rivera's mother, uh, and uh, others as they are listed here uh, in the bulletin. You know that the Lord says, Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will answer you, and you will glorify me. And so we bring all of our requests to him. We want to call your attention to the fact that next Sunday morning there will be a potluck uh, luncheon following the service. So please bring your favorite foods to share. Uh, please note that the elders meeting will not be held today. Also note the Easter lily uh, uh, slips in your bulletin so that we can start getting these filled out to order the Easter lilies. And then the loose insert in your bulletin uh, mentions this coming Wednesday. Please join us for the uh, supper at 6 o'clock for St. Patrick's Day. Wear some green and uh, bring something appropriate to the occasion. With our Lent midweek service at 7 p.m., Pastor Roberts will be bringing the message and I'll be doing the liturgy. And then two weeks, uh, actually a week from this coming Wednesday on the 24th of March, I really want to have a lot of people here, including uh, folks that typically do not come to our Wednesday services because we're going to have a dinner in honor of Pastor Roberts as he becomes our part-time assistant pastor for outreach. His commissioning will be that night. Uh, and his installation uh, at Holy Cross Lutheran Church as their full-time pastor will be on Pentecost Sunday. I believe it's the last Sunday of May. He was, was installed as our uh, colloquy vicar on Pentecost 2019. He concluded his vicarage on Pentecost 2020. The first day we came back inside to worship following our two months outside because of COVID-19. And he will be installed as their pastor on Pentecost 2021. So please plan now to come to those events and especially to his uh, comm commissioning here on the 24th and note the other announcements that are in the bulletin. In the prayer list, we would also remember Greg McLean, who is hospitalized because, because of COVID, a close friend of Gus and Elaine Gustafson. Um, Dan is still fighting, or has he passed? Okay, so this, that's what I thought. So he, he has gone to be with the Lord, but we would pray for his family uh, as they are uh, mourning the death of Dan Raspa, who after a valiant struggle of over a month with COVID-19 has gone to be with Christ. We would also have continued prayers for Sherry Smith for the Lord's blessing and help uh, and uh, the others in the bulletin. Reading to the bottom of the list, I see that there is also something that Terry Brown and Claudia Witcher would like to come forward to, to present. And this is a surprise to me, so I don't know anything what it's about. I do thank the Dorcas Society and the Lutheran Women's Missionary League, our two wonderful women's organizations, for these cards and whatever is inside. For my 66th birthday, which uh, I celebrated on Friday, and I'm thankful to the Lord for all of his blessings. The psalmist says, the lions have fallen in pleasant places. And if I had the time, I could detail those many blessings. But I look out here and I see many of them uh, in front of me. Let's rise now as we join together in prayer.
Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for your goodness and loving kindness, whereby you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, into this world to seek and to save the lost. Before his coming, the world was without hope, without God, and not knowing the way to eternal life in heaven. We thank you that as foretold by the prophets of the Old Testament and confirmed by the evangelists of the New Testament, Jesus Christ, born in Bethlehem, is your Son, our Savior, the Chosen One, the Messiah. To us, O Lord, we still see all the time as being divided by his birth. We thank you for fulfilling all of those promises of his coming, not only for the world, but for us personally, because by faith in Christ and through holy baptism, our lives too are forever changed. Uh, the letters A.D., Anno Domini, remind us that we are in the year of our Lord. It is this year which he gives us by his grace. He continues to provide all needful blessings for all those who live on earth. The God who created the world continues to preserve it, to protect it, and to provide for those that live in it. We thank you, Lord God, Heavenly Father, for your great love, especially shown then in the sending of your Son, Jesus, into this world. We are grateful that we who once were separated have now been brought near by the blood of Christ. We're grateful, Lord, that you've given us the message of the gospel to share with others that they too might repent of their sins, trust in Christ, and be reconciled to God. We ask you, Lord, to not let us be complacent or content to think that someone else might speak up for the Savior. Rather, we pray that you would bless our witness that we might do as John the Baptist did, pointing people to Jesus and saying, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We thank and praise you, Lord Jesus, that having brought us near by your blood, you are truly concerned about us as your children. And so we bring to you now the needs of those whom we have mentioned before you at your altar. For those that are still dealing with illness, awaiting test results, or are struggling, struggling because of personal, personal problems, we pray that you would bring healing, hope, and help. For those of you mourn the death of a loved one, including Dan Raspa and others that have been taken from us in the, uh, just in the near past because of COVID-19 or other illnesses, we would pray for their loved ones that they might not grieve as others who have no hope, but rather might uh, know that even though weeping endures for the night, joy cometh in the morning because Christ has been raised again. We thank you, O Lord, that we might see what our life was before your coming. We pray that you would help us always to remember that before picture, but especially to celebrate what life is now for us because of your saving grace and mercy. Grant us your blessing as a congregation. Provide for our needs. Bless this ministry. Bless Pastor Roberts as he begins his work among us as our assistant pastor for Aubrey. And as work is uh, completed at Holy Cross, uh, preparing a parsonage for uh, the uh, Roberts to live in, and, and uh, working also to beautify the church and to get it ready for years of renewed ministry, we pray that we might be a part of that, help and encourage it in every way possible. So bless also our Lutheran Church in the Synod, the Florida Georgia District. We thank you for all the blessings that you give to us, the ability to serve you. And we pray for your Holy Spirit strength and meet the means of grace to continue doing so as we pray in Jesus' name. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy.
Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, your mercies are new every morning. And though we deserve only punishment, you receive us as your children and provide for all our needs of body and soul. Grant that we may heartily acknowledge your merciful goodness, give thanks for all your benefits, and serve you in willing obedience. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, Almighty and everlasting God, you have safely brought us to the beginning of this day. Defend us in the same with your mighty power, and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings being ordered by your governance may be righteous in your sight, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.